Jonathan said. Let's stand and sing. Yes. Look, look at that. Oh, it's Sunday. Oh. Yeah. Stretch a little. <laughs> Let's praise the Lord. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the with me. That was a little touching. Our scripture this morning is taken from Luke 13, 1 through 9. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with the sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the other living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of his vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then I'll cut it down. And the other scripture is taken from Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, 
buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me, that my soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, the leader, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and because of the Lord your God, of Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. May God bless the reading of his word. If you've been down Route 1, heading towards Wakefield, you will know that every so often there are these U-turns, where, these places where you can make that U-turn. You've got to be in the fast lane in order to make it, uh, otherwise you may cut someone off and get in trouble. But when you're traveling down almost any highway, you will notice that there are places to make U-turns and there are places not to make U-turns. Today I want to talk about a place where U-turns are really encouraged, and that is in our lives. Urgency. Urgency. That's a word this week. Uh, I was talking with Phil Bryan, and he said, you know, we really don't preach enough about the urgency of the gospel. Well, you know, I probably wouldn't have chosen this passage from Luke 13 to preach on if I wasn't trying to follow the lectionary, which sets out certain texts that we should preach on or teach on during the course of three years so that we get through the whole Bible. Because nobody likes to preach on these subjects like repentance and sin and things like that. And yet they are very much a part of the gospel and the overall message. And here we're told that there's an urgency to it. It's, it's something that we really need to consider seriously and make a decision on. You know, Jesus often declared that the kingdom of God was either here or that it was coming. That was part of his message. Whatever else he had to say, he said, the kingdom of God is here, and so you need to do something. Or the kingdom of God is coming, it'll be soon. He urged people to drop what they were doing and to follow him. The passage that we're looking at today is a good example of that urgency with which he preached. He was saying, in effect, if you don't know what tomorrow will bring, stuff happens, so don't wait. You know, as I was thinking about this message this week, I was thinking about this great event that we used to bring our young people to when I was in Norwich. It was called the Word of Life Super Bowl. Now they call it Reverb, and I'm not sure where the name comes from, but it was just a fun night for the kids. You'd start off at a, at a minor league basketball game, either up in Springfield or a hockey game here in Providence, and, and after that, you would head off to a night filled with bowling and roller skating and pizza, and so, so much pizza and soda. I remember stuffing myself and, uh, and seeing the kids do it too, so their stomachs couldn't fill anymore. But it was just a great night. But in order to put this all together, and the purpose of the evening really was to share the gospel message with kids. And, and they often brought in a youth pastor who spoke a very clear presentation of the gospel and told them what it was all about, gave the Easter message, the Good Friday message, all of it wrapped up so that they would know for sure what Jesus did and why. That was good. The, the part that I really 
didn't like so much, though, was that they would then, after preaching the message, what I call scare the kids. They would say to them, okay, you've heard the message, it's time to make a decision now. And they'd kind of say, we're going to have these groups, you're going to go up and we'll pray with you. But then they'd say, I just want you to think about this. You could be leaving here off to have a good time. You could walk out on the street and get hit by a car and die. And it could happen. And, 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 and would you know if you're going to go to heaven or not? And I always thought that that was, that was over the top. I, I understood why they were doing it, but there's some truth in it. But it put a damper on the night for me. Not that the question wasn't valid. I know there are a lot of people who are still asking today, people who have been in church their whole life, who say, am I saved? Will I go to heaven if I die? I just think that there was a better way to get the message across because I don't believe that anyone should be coerced or scared into accepting Christ. It should be because of the gracious and loving invitation of our Lord to come follow me. I believe that knowing how much God loves us and what He did for us on the cross is all the impetus that is needed to change and make a decision. That alone should get us thinking what we need to do in response to it. So today I want to talk about that response though. It begins with the why and why now and why can't it wait. You know, that's the answer to the question that Jesus was posing to his disciples that day. He, he was talking about situations that were probably very familiar to them. The first was that the, the Roman government was taking the blood of the dead Galileans, good Jews, and mixing it with the blood of the sacrifices that they were offering to their gods. For a Jew, they'd be horrified. It would be like the worst thing, the, the blood would make them unclean and unable to be able to, to, to be considered in God's presence. And Jesus asked the question, he says, you know this is happening. Are those people who this is happening to worse than everybody else? Or is it simply because of the nature of the world we live in that whoever is caught is being punished this way? And then he said, you know that tower that fell down in Siloam? It fell down and it killed 18 people. Were those people any worse than anyone else? No, he says, in this instance as well. Things happen. Good people die every day from circumstances beyond their control. Look at what's happening in the Ukraine. Are those people bad people? Jesus would say, no, they don't deserve it. Life happens because we live in a fallen world. And so Jesus says, repent, repent today, come to God before it's too late. You see, we live in this fallen world where there are no guarantees, we know that. That's the effect of sin. Just because you live a clean life doesn't mean you won't suffer a bad fate. So you can't put off the important decisions. You need to decide today. You must get right with God. That's the urgency that I'm talking about. We sometimes live as if we have a thousand tomorrows. We procrastinate. We ask, what does it matter? I may not like the approach they take in the word of life, and yet there is a biblical basis, and this passage in Scripture calls our attention to it, that Jesus says, now is the time to decide. Years ago, I had a man who wanted to be baptized. Now, he was in his late 70s. Now, I was in my late 20s, so I thought he was really, really old. You know, 70 doesn't look so old anymore, I have to tell you. But he wanted to be baptized. But when we talked about it, he said, I've got to get some things right in my life. And so I said, okay. And then he kept putting it off and putting it off. And every time we talk, he says, I'm not quite there yet. And finally, I said to him, I said, the truth is, our life will never be perfect. We will never have everything in order. And if you wait until that day, you may miss your opportunity. And I think this is what Jesus was saying, is don't wait. Get things right today. Now, one of the things I don't preach on a lot is the fact that there's going to be a judgment day. The second part of this parable speaks to that. Jesus tells a parable about a fig tree. And he says it's not bearing any fruit. And so he, he says to him, cut it down. It's had its time and the time is over. 
But the vine dresser, the gardener says, no, no, wait, wait. Let me take care of it for a while and, 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 and give it another year and see what I can do. I'll fertilize it. I will bless it. I will take care of it. And then if you see no change, then have your way. The truth is that God is much more patient than the master in the story because Jesus is the vine dresser. Jesus is the one who wants to work with us and bless our lives and, and bring us into a closer relationship with his father, the father, the God of us all. And God is hoping that we'll all look at our lives and make the U-turns that will bring us back to him if we've been away. And it begins with looking at our lives and seeing what needs to be changed. Once you meet Jesus, you can't stay the way you are. He calls you to be a better you. He calls you to make that U-turn if you have been drifting off course and getting into things that you know are non-productive or hurtful to your life. You see, once you realize what Christ has done for you, and that's the whole intent of Lent, this season where we're looking at ourselves, looking at God, looking at what Christ did, and trying to come to this understanding of how and why all this happened, and then what we're going to do about it. You see, once you realize what Jesus did, it changes everything. You know, I like the story told about King Frederick II, the king of Prussia. He was very active and involved in the 18th century. And one day he went to this prison in Berlin. And the inmates, when they saw the king, they knew he had the power to pardon them. And so they all went up and started sharing how they were innocent. They were there and, and they were convicted, you know, wrongly. And that they had never done any of the charges that were against them. And the king, as he looked at all these men pleading and pleading with their innocence, he saw one man sitting in the back. And he wanted to know what his story was. And so he, he, he went through the crowd and he went to that man and he said, how come you're not up front like all the others? What charge do you have against you? And he said, he said yes, I, I was guilty of robbery. I went in and I took things that didn't belong to me. And so I'm guilty and the king said, are you sorry about it? And he said, yes. He says, then that's why I'm doing my time. So the king thought about it for a moment. The story goes that he gave an order to the guards. He said, release this guilty man. I don't want him corrupting all these other innocent people. <laughs> and in that instant, that prisoner discovered the reward of true repentance, of knowing your guilt confessing it and letting your sorrow be known. You know, it's only natural to feel remorse when you've messed up. To understand that there are consequences for our actions is a sign of maturity. When we've made mistakes, the process of making things right is called repentance. It's an action. It's saying that you're sorry and then making the changes that you need to make so that you won't be tempted to do it again. We don't talk about repentance regularly in our society. It seems like there are very few things that are taboo anymore. We've adopted slogans like, if it feels right, go ahead and do it. Irregardless of what we know is right and good, it's embracing all that it may, it's embracing all that may take us away from the higher morality that Jesus calls us to. The truth is that we often fall short of what God wants of us and expects of us and hopes for us, and we end up hurting others and ignoring God. Well, Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about repentance. Right at the outset of his ministry, we read in Matthew chapter 4, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And at the end of his ministry, he was still preaching that same message and he gave it to the disciples to preach. It says in Luke 24, 46, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You see, repentance is a part of the gospel message. It means that we can change, we can start over, we can begin again. And we don't have to have the chains to bind us down of our past. 
You know, it's the first thing that we do when we commit to following Jesus. When you enter the waters of baptism, what you're saying is this, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. That's the first step in repentance. And now I want to follow you. I give my life to you and I want to begin again. And that's the second step, the action step in repentance. I tell everyone that's baptized that this is the first step on your journey of faith. You're baptized. Now you're walking with Jesus. But the truth is, as soon as you make that commitment, the temptations will come. You'll be tested. Even Jesus, immediately following his baptism, was whisked away to be tempted in the wilderness by the devil. But the key is to keep coming back to the well of Jesus' forgiveness because he loves us and asking him to forgive us again and again and again. You see, when you step off the path, when you make a turn where you're not supposed to go, you need to come back, make that U-turn, and ask His forgiveness. The good news is this, that if you do it with a repentant heart, a strong desire to change, He will forgive you. Most importantly, He will help you change those things that you can't do yourself. He will do what you cannot do. This is what the Apostle Paul was speaking about in his letter to the Romans. We read this in Romans 7. Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. <laughs> Confession time. The other night, I had a Klondike bar. The other night, I had a Klondike bar, and it was good, and I enjoyed every minute of it, but almost from the moment I put the wrapper in the garbage can, my brain started saying, boy, I'd like to have another one, <laughs> and I wrestled with that. I wrestled with that, and, and I kept thinking, you know, I don't need it. That should be enough, and, and, what, and I understood that battle that Paul says we go through, and maybe for you it's something different, but for me it's things like this. And I went into the bed and I said, if I just can go to sleep, I'll be okay and I won't have to worry about it and it'll be passed. And I laid there and it must have been 15 minutes later when suddenly, like in a trance, I got out of the bed and I went to the stairs going down to the basement where the freezer is and I traveled down those stairs and as I stood at the freezer, I ate that second Klondike bar. <laughs> I do not know what I do. I hate what I do. The Apostle Paul would understand. But Paul, knowing he had a problem, concludes by saying this, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, there are some times where we want to turn around, we want to repent, and we just can't. We're stuck in whatever it is, and something within us, that human part of us, keeps telling us, yes, you've got to do this, and you fight, and you wrestle with it, and, and sometimes you say, I just always seem to lose, and that's where we go back to Christ. We make that U-turn, and in Him we find the strength to be able to break free. You see, the good news is that once we repent, once we go to Christ and ask for His help, Jesus will help us. And going back to that question they asked the kids at the Super Bowl, you don't have to wonder if you're going to heaven anymore. If you've made that U-turn and come to Christ and ask for forgiveness, you will know because He's opened the gates to be with the Father in heaven. You see, that's the promise of Isaiah 51 that Skip read. Come to the Lord, you who are hungry and thirsty. If you are struggling with life and need something more, He will give you all that you need. He made a covenant, a promise that all who come to Him will find shelter and protection. And He calls on everyone, even the wicked, to come to Him and receive His mercy and forgiveness. That's what the cross is about. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Once you know Jesus, you realize it's worth it to take that U-turn to come back to Him because you won't find condemnation in Him. You will find strength and help and salvation for your soul. 
God loves us. I've told this story before, but I was in college and going through a a rough spell. My life was really kind of on the rails. And one night I went to a friend's wedding and I had a couple of my fraternity brothers in the car and uh, I probably, no, not probably, I had too much to drink and uh, was not totally in control. And as we were getting on an exit ramp, um, I ran right into the back of another car. My car was smashed up, the front was smashed in and couldn't be driven. And so uh, that was my first and only time riding in the back of a police cruiser. (laughs) I didn't get arrested, I don't know how. In those days, they were much more liberal with the laws. But uh, my buddies and I all went to the police station in Hartford. And uh, from there, I had to call my dad, come pick me up. That was one of the hardest calls of my life I ever had to make. And for the 45 minutes it took for him to get there to pick me up, I kept thinking of what I was going to say and what he was going to say, and I ran through this thing in my head a million times, knowing that I was going to be in big trouble. And he got there, and he said to me, he said, you okay? And I said, yeah, get in the car. We got in the car, we rode all the way back, 45 minutes, didn't say a word. We pulled into our driveway, and I just began to apologize. and said, Dad, I'm so sorry, I was so stupid, I, I should never have done that, I will never do it again. And all he said was, good, that's okay. Now go in and go to sleep and we'll take care of things in the morning. You know, I think that's the way it is with God. Sometimes we're afraid to go with God because we know the things that we've done and the things we've struggled with and some of them are not pretty. And yet, when we come to God and we repent, we make that U-turn, God comes with his arms outstretched, loving us, ready to forgive, ready to deal with it in the morning, even if it's the second time or the third time or more. But it all starts with us. See, that's the message that Jesus was trying to say to people. You come, turn around, come back to me, and you will find the love and the grace of God. So how's the road you're traveling? Are you feeling a little lost and out of control? then turn around and let God take control. Because I can tell you this, from my experience and from the testimony of Scripture, He will not steer you wrong. He's ready and waiting. So make that U-turn and come back to Him if you've been away. Amen. We're going to close our service today by singing number 584. We're going to sing all the verses.